So we had a great All Saints party on Friday. Many of you were there. There was a, a group theme. We've always had great All Saints fancy dress parties, but lots of people came as groups. It was very creative. We had Matthew, Mark, Luke and John walk in the door together. We had Caspar, Melchior and Balthazar, the three wise men. We had Cosmas and Damien. So I don't know what was in the air, whether it was just a coincidence or it was carefully thought through. But of course, Friday night was overshadowed by the scandal of the rigged election meaning I didn't win best costume. (laughs) But I did win, unofficially, most obscure saint, together with Tom, who came as Peter Morin. Is Tom here? Anyway, Tom got joint first prize with me as most obscure saint. I came as, hands up if you've heard of him, Blessed Serafino Mala. That proves my point, doesn't it? Yeah? (laughs) Serafino Mala, also known as El Pele, that's his nickname, the strong one, the great one, like the football player. (coughs) Serafino grew up in Spain in the late 19th century. He was a Romany gypsy. In the UK we talk about the travelling community, but in Spain it's often common to talk about the Roma, the Romany, the gypsy communities. He was illiterate, he traded horses, He was someone, like all the the Romani, the Gypsies, on the edge of society, but he had a profound Catholic faith, and he became a catechist, a teacher, a friend to many of the the non-travelling communities in the north of Spain around Barbastro. And during the, the tragedy, the terrors and the horrors of the Spanish Civil War, something happened that changed his life. He was walking through the street and he saw a priest being attacked in the street, lynched really. And instead of walking by, he went to intervene and said, you can't do this, stop, this, this is outrageous. He defended a man who was being beaten up and quite possibly murdered. And because he stood in to defend this priest, he was taken with the priest and imprisoned. He was called to renounce his faith, and he said, I can't do that, I'm a Christian. But then, it was very sad, the mayor of the town was a great friend of his, a communist, a friend. And he said, look, Serafino, I know you love Jesus, let's not get too deep, just give me your rosary as a sign that you're giving up your faith, Even though I know you love Jesus, just give me the rosary as a sign that you're renouncing your faith and you can walk out of this prison free. And he said, I can't. I can't. How can I say to the world I'm renouncing my faith? How can I give up publicly what is most precious to me and what is most important? And he refused to give up his rosary. This is why I came with a wooden rosary round my neck on Friday night. He refused to give it up, and because of that, he was taken with ten other men to the cemetery, and he was shot by a firing squad. A Christian martyr, dying for his faith, and beautifully, the, the end, or if you like, the beginning of the story, in 1997, he was beatified as the first gypsy saint, the first beatification by St John Paul and there were thousands of Romani who'd come from all over Europe to witness one of their own being beatified in St Peter's. So All Saints, I didn't plan this for the sermon, this was completely random, it's because I had an old jacket and a rosary and no, no, no costume to wear. But just, it leads to a question which helps us to understand the scripture readings today which is from the story of Blessed Serafino, what do we learn about the Christian understanding of the human body? The human body. Well, the first part of the story, the priest attacked in the street, we learn about the fundamental value of human bodily life. The dignity of the human person that someone is being attacked, an act of violence, 
And this isn't something you can just ignore, say, oh, it doesn't matter, we believe in the soul, we believe this priest will go to heaven. No, if someone's body is being attacked, they are being attacked. This is our theology, our anthropology, meaning the philosophy of the human person. You can't say the body doesn't matter. It is of fundamental importance. And that's why it was so wrong that the priest was attacked and so right that Serafino went to help him. But we also learn from the witness of Serafino's martyrdom that though the body is of fundamental value, it is not an absolute value. Because sometimes we will need to sacrifice it, to let go of it for a greater good. And all of us, at the end of life, will have to let go of it. Serafino is a martyr, like the Jewish martyrs that we read about in the Old Testament reading from the Maccabean period. He loved his life as a gift from God, but he was willing, like the Jewish martyrs, to give up his life for something greater. In this case, to witness to his faith and to witness to the hope of resurrection. So in this sense, bodily life is a good, but it's not an ultimate good. It's relative to something greater, the hope of the bodily resurrection and the truth of our faith. All of this is the Christian theology of bodily life. And let me just summarise it if I can. So our body is a gift. It's part of our dignity as human persons. And this is such an important phrase, such an important teaching. As Christians, we believe in the unity of body and soul. That there is a material aspect to our lives and there is a spiritual aspect to our lives. Both are essential. We are not, to use the philosophical jargon, dualists, as if the body is only secondary or accidental to our spiritual life. We don't believe, as it were, in the soul inside the body, like, using another phrase of a philosopher, a ghost in a machine. We believe in embodied souls, or put it another way, ensouled bodies. We are a unity, <coughs> the unity of the human person, body and soul. And the fundamental dignity of our lives as human persons, as bodily creatures, not because of your talents or your abilities or your external beauty, but simply because you are human. You are a son, a daughter of God. And this is true if you are unborn in the womb. It's true if you are forgotten by society. It's true if you are in prison. It's true if you are sick. It's true if you are dying and near the very end of your bodily existence. This is put so beautifully by St. John Paul II in his encyclical Evangelium Vitae, which some of us were studying two, two weeks ago here at a medical ethics conference. That your dignity is not because of what you can do. Of course, what we do is a sign of that, to speak, to love, to laugh, to share, to think, to create. But your fundamental dignity is because of who you are and your ability to love and to be loved. And if you're not capable at a given moment of loving, you are certainly capable of being loved. And that dignity can never ever, should never ever, be taken away from you. I've had two conversations by chance about reincarnation this week. Yeah? So it's just worth underlining this in case there's any doubt for any of you. As Christians, we don't believe in reincarnation, that the soul can hop around from one body to another. We don't believe in just reanimation, meaning, oh, we die and then we just come back to life in the same way. 
like a, a continuity, like Lazarus coming out of the tomb. We believe, as Christians, in bodily resurrection. That our life will be given back to us, our bodies will be raised from the dead, but now glorified, sharing in the divine life of Jesus Christ. So there is a continuity, this is my body, raised from the dead, but it is glorified in a way beyond our understanding. This is the message of the gospel story today. This poor woman, it's a story, okay, it's not a, it's a, it's a parable as it were, who has seven husbands dead and she meets them all in heaven. It's not about their continuing married life together, says Jesus. She will meet them. The Pharisees are mocking Jesus. Oh, it's ridiculous. How can she meet her husbands? She will meet them. But she will meet them in order to live a radical new life with them as children of God, like the angels. In one sense, that there's no need for married life anymore. Not because married life is unimportant, but because the love and intimacy and communion of marriage will be shared by all, not by none. If you like, it's an exaltation of marriage. The marriage of these individuals is taken up into the great marriage feast of the Lamb. Continuity and newness. How do you know this in the resurrection stories of Jesus? Just have a think. Well, the continuity is the empty tomb. It's Jesus' body that lay dead in the tomb that is raised to life. And when Jesus appears to the disciples, what does he show them? The wounds on his hands. This is me. This is my body. It was wounded on Good Friday and it stands here before you now on Easter Sunday. But how do we know the newness, the discontinuity? Well, just think of the times that Jesus was not recognised by Mary Magdalene in the garden, by the disciples on the way to Emmaus. Something was new. Something was different. Because Jesus was living the life beyond the tomb, the life of the resurrection, the eternal life that he shared forever. Now what's the implications of all this? We've had an understanding of the Christian understanding of the body. Well, first of all, it's that we have a profound respect for human bodily life and for our own bodies and for the bodies and the lives and the dignity of others. To care for our bodies. To honour them, not to harm them, not to disregard them. To honour the bodies of others. And I mean simply, you walk into a room and, and you notice that someone is there and you honour them by saying hello and talking and recognising the respect for another starts with very simple things. Our care for the poor and the sick, the wonderful tradition of Christian medicine going beyond Christianity to the Hippocratic Oath. This is a line that you medics and healthcare professionals would recognise from the ancient Greek Hippocratic Oath. And I quote, this is over 2,000 years old. Into whatsoever houses I enter, I will enter to help the sick, and I will abstain from all intentional wrongdoing and harm, especially from abusing the bodies of man or woman, bond or free. And a lovely sign of this honouring, some of you will have heard this before, but in the ancient wedding vows, in the Christian tradition in England, these are the words that are used. With this ring, I thee wed. With my body, I thee worship. With all my worldly goods, I thee endow. Isn't that beautiful? 
With this ring I thee wed, you will carry this ring on your body. We are bonded together. With my body I thee worship, not as in divine worship, but honour and respect. And this is bodily, physical. I care for you as a person. I care for you standing before me. And with all my worldly goods I thee endow. I don't just say, oh, I love you really, and walk in the opposite direction and never give a monkey's for you. I, I care for you with, with the person that I am, with, with my body, my goods, my time, my money. This is the wedding vows. And how much more it's a symbol for the relationship that all of us are meant to have with all. I honour you. I honour your human dignity. I honour and respect your bodily life. I do this now because your life is precious. But I do this in the hope of the bodily re resurrection. That your body, your life, doesn't just have a temporal, present temporary meaning. But it has an eternal meaning when, God willing, we will rise with Christ in glory. <laughs>